Food Geiger Magic Man. John Geiger was a tall, lanky man, so slender his light gray work pants were always too large in the waist and had to be gathered in tightly by a belt. He pulled an engineer's cap snugly down on his closely cropped hair and inevitably had a chaw of tobacco tucked in his cheek, spitting the juice out at frequent intervals. His eyes twinkled when he smiled, just a hint of his good sense of humor, a quality for his nece necessary for his hobby. He was a self-taught magician. His act began as he popped on a tall black top hat and waved his magic wand. <coughs> magic it surely was, for when he handed it to anyone else in the room, it wilted immediately, <laughs> like a dead rose. His next bit of magic always amazed young and old. The children would be horrified as the blade of a wooden apparatus slammed down on a long carrot, chopping it in half, sending the two pieces flying. They knew that one of them soon would be offering up a sacrificial finger to this brutal machine, the guillotine, as John called it. And then the smile broadened and his eyes twinkled as a child's trembling, stubby finger was offered up for execution. As usual, the blade dropped, but the finger amazingly remained attached, and John winked. Next trick. He was born in 1889 in Catawissa, Pennsylvania, the first of five children. When John was 12 and in sixth grade, his father died, and he was forced to quit school and become the family breadwinner, <coughs> working in a grocery store and cleaning barns and stables. One horse in particular at the stables became special. Dan Patch soon took up all John's spare time, and the friendship they shared was just the beginning of a long love affair with horse racing. <laughs> For the rest of his life, he would spend his leisure time and spare money at the track. <laughs> I remember that. <laughs> so do I. He got me started. <laughs> In time, the stable job John loved had to be discarded for a more profitable <laughs> offer, a job with the railroad. His exact job there is not known, but he traveled from town to town on the trains, and as relatives recall, he met Charlotte Lottie Steinbach on one of his journeys. Lottie was a pretty quiet girl with long hair, occasionally pulled back at the nape of her neck with a big bow. John must have charmed Lottie with his humor and dedication to his work and family, for at 19 he and Lottie were married, and a year later their first child, a girl, Rhoda, was born, the first of an eventual five daughters. When John was 25, he and Lottie and the family moved to Clinton, Ohio, where he had taken a job with the Tidewater Pipe Company. Before moving, he took piano lessons and was very fond of playing. Rhoda recalls many evenings in Ohio, laying in bed listening to Papa, as Lottie and the girls called him, playing and singing Asleep in the Deep. His booming bass was so clear and tone true that he occasionally sang in variety shows that were produced at Clinton High School. This is news to me. <laughs> as a father and husband, John was alternately stern, critical, strict, sarcastic, and opinionated. He was comparable to a character of fiction, a patriarch like the father in Life with Father, or maybe Frank Gilbreth, the time study man in Cheaper by the Dozen. Although domineering and stern, he was very proud of his girls, Rhoda, Dorothea, Belva, Anna Jane, and Myrna, and kept a watchful eye on all they did. Oh, I guess he did. <laughs> <laughs> when he was angry, they were afraid and even shook, but none recalls any severe lickings. His lectures were punishment enough and could and would go on endlessly, even lecturing boyfriends on some occasions. <laughs> One of his most frequent lectures was, ironically, on the sin of gambling. <laughs> Ironic and humorous, for John walked three miles every Saturday night on the railroad tracks to a card game held in town, <laughs> enjoying the sin of gambling. 
Lottie was a strict Methodist, so naturally she disapproved of this weekly trip. But the children never recall that she even voiced an opinion. She attended church on Sunday without John. John and Lottie, or Papa and Mama, spent most of their life just trying to survive. John had chores in and out of the house, and so did Lottie. He plowed a big garden every summer, fertilized with sheep manure brought grudgingly by handfuls by the young girl. <laughs> they owned sheep and pigs, which were Mama's job to feed, and in turn, Papa slaughtered them, made sausage and scrapple in the cellar. He called the scrapple pond hoss. What's that? That's the name of Dutch. An unusual chore that Lottie had was hunting frogs in the swamp yeah. for, of course, frog leg dinners. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. John made cakes in a cast iron skillet, pickled dandelion greens for a salad, served with bacon dressing, and made his own dandelion wine. The wine became a ritual in which everyone was expected to partake. John ceremoniously pouring and serving family and guests the elixir that would cure all ills. <laughs> Along with the wine, he passed around crackers with his favorite cheeses, Limburger and Schmierkäse. <laughs> I remember in the refrigerator that Limburger cheese, if you opened it, oh, the odor was... And it, he always wanted you to yeah, <laughs> take a smell of this, and, and of course you <laughs> it was really just another one of his tricks. He always gave one to Lottie, she getting the cracker as far as her chin, and then declining weakly, Oh, John, it's bad. <laughs> <laughs> Mama and Papa ran a co-op in their cellar, sorting and stocking the groceries for the neighbor members to pick up. Eggs were stored in a crock of water called eggs in glass. Yeah, eggs in glass. <laughs> Frequently one would spoil and the cellar air would be unbearable until the rotten egg was found. The cellar saw a lot of action. On Mondays it was the weekly wash. This all-day job put John in one of his unusual bad moods, for his job was to scrub the clothes on a washboard by hand. The girls loaded a copper boiler on a wagon and pulled it two or three city blocks to the pumping station where Papa worked to get hot water and returned with a heavily laden wagon. Right. Mundy's mood in the Geiger cellar was tense on all his cars and kept them in top condition. <clears throat> his first car was bought in Clinton, a country club overland touring car. He and the family made trips in this car back to Catawissa, Pennsylvania for holidays with their relatives, camping out overnight on the road in bed rolls. On the running board of the car was a special box built by John to contain all the camping gear. Mama sat up front next to Papa reading the maps, and Papa chewed and spit and called her, Hey, Chief, to strangers when he needed direction. <laughs> <laughs> As they sped along, probably at 30 miles an hour, <laughs> the girls all in the back seat would have to duck to miss getting hit with the flying tobacco chew. <laughs> Since cars had not yet been perfected as a means of transportation, it seemed as though something would go wrong on every trip. On one excursion to the circus in Akron, the axle broke and was quite a production to fix. Yeah. Oh, I remember that. <laughs> Another time, John was standing out in front of the car, cranking the starter, when the lever slipped, flew up, hit him in the mouth, and broke his front tooth. <laughs> As a reminder of the accident, John sported a shiny gold tooth in the center of his tricky grin for the rest of his life. <laughs> his second car, a Studebaker Roadster, was always stuck in the mud of every spring thaw. It was Belva who stood at the back of the car, shoving newspapers under the rear wheels as Papa gunned the motor. And with every spin of the wheels, Belva was covered in mud. <laughs> In the 40s, John had a Buick, always clean and polished, and gave visiting grandchildren rides into town. The inside of the Buick smelled of prickly woolen seat covers and stale cigarette smoke, lucky strikes. Oh, yeah. From Clinton, Ohio, John and Lottie moved their family to a large, gray, rambling Victorian home with a wraparound porch. 
John had been transferred to Changewater, New Jersey, and the house was a company house and came with the job rent-free. He was a telegraph operator, but was also foreman at the station, a large brick building filled with chrome machinery, greased black at the joints, noisily pumping oil in and out, up and down. There were black rubber paths and black iron steps and catwalks winding in and out of the massive tubular pipes, and the air was permeated with the odor of oil and gasoline. I remember that going down to the station to check on Papa. From the house to the station, the walk was short, the countryside quiet and serene, but as the door to the station opened, the noise was deafening. The only respite from the racket was in John's office, where the telegraph sat on his oak desk. From his desk, John could look out and see the big gray house. Winter evenings after dinner, John sat close to the fire reading National Geographic or drawing cartoons for the Tidewater newspaper. In addition to the drawings, John also wrote poetry and claimed to get all his inspiration <coughs> sitting in the outhouse. <laughs> <laughs> he cupped his ear now and then to hear the news on the radio, spitting tobacco juice in the stove fire and delighting in catching Lottie napping in her chair. Before retiring, he filled the black pot-bellied stove with coal or wood, hoping that the heat would rise upstairs by the black registers in the floor of each bedroom. These registers were also joyously used by the children to eavesdrop on adult conversations downstairs. Papa had his own surefire method of protection from the winter clothes, cold. Under his work clothes, and even to bed, his body was covered by a white bird's eye cloth union suit. I, I remember him. He always wore long underwear. In Changewater, John's spare time was spent gardening, trout fishing, and at Edson's general store. There was always a group of men around the pot-bellied stove exchanging news and gossip while warming themselves. Edson became a local character. The store was a typical general store post office where everyone stopped in at least once a day. Papa loved to tell about Edson's trademark, a dirty black smudge of a fingerprint, and how he left it on everything he sold in the store, especially the hand-dipped white ice cream carton. <laughs> but that was the best ice cream. <laughs> John bought Mama's favorite flavor, vanilla, the vanilla with the black specks in it. And he always announced loud, loudly, Edson left his trademark again. <laughs> After John retired at 65, he and Lottie spent winters in Florida, where John enjoyed frequent betting at the dog races. Their daughters all married and raised 12 grandchildren, and John enjoyed teasing them with the same lectures he had seriously given his daughters. He lured the grandchildren with a stick of Wrigley's peppermint gum, sat them on his lap, and began his spiel. The favorite lecture now was on the dangers of smoking, and as he finished, he lit a cigarette <laughs> and tried his darndest to get the children to take a puff just to see how well they had listened. John Geiger's fingers always moved exactly, precisely, the fingers of a magician. Yet magic was just a part of it. He lived as if he were on stage. His every move commanded attention and seemed executed only for a reaction. From tapping telegraph keys to the flourish of eating a hot noontime meal, he was fascinating to watch. It was at one of these noon dinners that Papa used his well-known theatrics to emphasize a point. He and Lottie were just beginning the meal with their grown daughter Rhoda, her husband Paigey, and their two children, Linda and Johnny. The table was spread with a freshly ironed lace tablecloth and set with multicolored dinnerware, green, yellow, blue, orange, called fiesta ware. The main course was cream chip beef on toast, and in little dishes on the side, Mama's specialty, thinly sliced cucumbers and onions in vinegar. After saying grace, John began to season his food and discovered the round orange salt, salt shaker was empty. Lottie was still in the kitchen, so John picked up the shaker and with a wide sweep of his arm, 
rolled it all the way into the kitchen, loudly bellowing, Lottie, let's have some salt. <laughs> Laughing broadly, he glanced at the others with that twinkling of mischief radiating from his eyes. It was just a small bit of theater from a magic man. <laughs> Very nice.